Good evening. I did it louder and with a little more pizzazz, didn't I? It's good to be with you this evening. So glad you came back. Going to begin this evening a preaching series through the book of 1 Peter. I am a big fan of preaching series through books, especially the smaller books, they're easier to handle, of the New Testament. Because a lot of times when we think about the Bible and the books that are in the Bible, and again, I won't throw you under the bus. When I often have thought about books in the Bible, it's like the people that wrote these things knew that this was going to be a book in the Bible. You know, God sent them a, an email and he said, I need you to write a book that contains these themes and these principles. Could you do that for me? I need it by this deadline. Thank you. Now, most of the letters in the New Testament, obviously the exception of the Gospel and Acts, which were talking about Jesus, his life, death, burial, resurrection, Acts, talking about the growth of the church. But the rest of the letters were letters written by an individual to either another individual or a congregation or several congregations in the face of some issue, trying to reach out. I'm sure, you know, there are a lot of letters that we do not have. When you read First and Second Corinthians, it's obviously that there's another letter somewhere that we don't have. Same thing with 1 Peter and 2 Peter. He mentions a third letter that we don't have. But these have been preserved for us because they fulfilled God's will of giving us information, things that we needed to know. So as we study these letters, we need to understand that there was a man of God who was writing a letter to Christians to help them to make it. And here we sit, I stand, as Christians trying to make it. And here we have this letter. Let's take advantage of it. The introduction and overview will be today, so we're going to talk about the details of the letter. You know, got to get that out of the way. Got to talk about who the author was. Got to talk about when it was written, where it was written, and who the audience was. And then we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about the three major themes that we find in 1 Peter. And they are persecution, um, the appointing of value, what, what do we give value to in our lives, uh, and the second one is a relationships, okay? And then we'll take the last couple of minutes and we're going to talk about how that applies to us today. So to begin, the who, when, and the where. The author is Peter. Why? Because 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ too. So he's the writer. And so we know this Peter. He is Simon, who was called Peter in Luke 6, 13 through 14. Jesus gave him that name. Something that's common in the Bible, God giving his servants special names or changing the names that they had. Abram went from Abram to Abraham. Simon went from Simon to Simon Peter. <coughs> he was an apostle, as he said. Understand the word apostle. It simply means in the Greek, one who is sent, okay? That's where we get the name of our postal service from the word apostle. It's ascending. He was one specially sent out by the Lord to spread the good news about the kingdom. What else do we know about Peter from this writing? Well, he was a married man. How do I know that? Well, if you look over at chapter 5 and verse 1, he says, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder. Okay? Well, one of the qualifications of being an elder is you must be a married man. And we know he's a married man. He refers to her in verse 13 of chapter 5, but in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 14, you may recall that Jesus came over to his house and Peter's mother-in-law was sick with a fever. It is super hard to have a mother-in-law unless you're married. So Peter was married. We also read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 5, Paul is talking about the fact that there are other apostles who are allowed to take their wives with them as they go about doing their work, and they are supported. And his point is, don't I have the right to be supported as I want as well? And he says, or does only Cephas get to take a wife with him? which means Cephas, Peter, Simon, all the same person, had a wife who traveled with him 
when he would go about working his ministry. And again, that reference in chapter 5 and verse 13, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. And we're pretty sure that's a reference to his wife. So Peter is the author, the apostle Peter, an elder in the church, uh, which means, and we know that he was a married man. And then it says, back to chapter 1, verse 1, oh, nope, written, verse 12 of chapter 5, it says, by Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly. Okay? That word by is the Greek word dia, diameter. Um, it means through, by means of Sylvanus. Well, what does that mean? Well, it probably means that Peter didn't actually do the penning of this letter. It was probably written by Sylvanus, who we believe is the Silas of Acts chapter 15 that traveled along with Paul, um, that Sylvanus is the one that actually wrote it out. It was his amanuensis, right? Paul often used an amanuensis. In Romans, who wrote the, the Roman letter, church? Well, Paul did, absolutely. Then why does verse 22 of Romans 16 say, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord? No, well, because Paul dictated it, and Tertius wrote it down. And as he's signing off, he says, and I say hi too. I'm the one who wrote this letter. Okay, very common thing in our world even today. Um, so more than likely written through Silas which is an interesting thing in conjunction with our Sunday morning Bible class. One of the big complaints about Peter being the author of 1 Peter and of 2 Peter is the Greek is a little too good for a fisherman from Galilee. Say they, right? Like they don't know how well Peter maybe did in Greek class when he was in elementary school, I don't know. But if he's writing through Silas, well then I might expect the Greek to be a little different, right? Because Peter didn't actually write it. He simply dictated it. So the author, obviously, ultimately, the author is the Holy Spirit, but the author here is Peter, the apostle whom we know. The letter is believed to have been written shortly before the destruction of Jerusalem, probably around A.D. 65. Why? It gets a little complicated, but stick with me. In Colossians 4 and verse 10, we read, as Paul is saying his goodbyes, that John Mark was in Rome with him. He wrote that letter in prison. And that he was going to be headed for Asia Minor. He was going to send him to Colossae. Okay? Um, he probably accompanied the people that took that letter from Rome to Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, John Mark is in Ephesus, more than likely, with Timothy. That's where Timothy did much of his ministry. And Paul, at the end of that letter, again, he's in prison in Rome, and he says, why don't you bring John Mark to me here in Rome? He is useful to me for ministry. So the first letter, A.D. 62-63, John Mark is in Rome, going to be sent to Asia Minor. In the second letter we talked about, 2 Timothy 4.11, He's in Asia Minor, and Paul requests that he comes back. That was about 67 A.D. We believe 1 Peter was written in between those two, about A.D. 65, because at the end we read that John Mark is with Peter, and he's giving it to them. And who were the audience? The audience were the folks in Asia Minor. Clear as, clear as mud? Again, we try not to be dogmatic with these dates. These are pretty well uh, believed and accepted dates, but nailing it down any sharper than that, we just don't have the information. And understand, what does that mean? That means it must not be that important either. The letter appears to have been written from Babylon. Why? Because he says, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. So it appears that he was writing from Babylon. Well, the question is, which Babylon? What are you talking about? At the time of this writing, that empire we know of, of Babylon, doesn't exist anymore. It hasn't existed for 500 years. Now, there may have been some people living there. Is that what he's talking about? 
There was a small village in Egypt that was called Babylon that was a site of a Christian settlement. Could that have been where he was writing from? Possibly. Could he have been using the term Babylon figuratively? The Apostle John in the Revelation spoke about uh, Rome as the great Babylon, right? So is he writing from Rome and saying, she who is with me in Babylon, wink, wink, Rome, greets you? Or could even be referring to Jerusalem in a figurative sense since the corruption and the rejection of Christ by the Jews in Jerusalem right before its destruction? The answer is, we don't know. And again, we try not to be dogmatic. Scholars, whatever, you, whatever weight you give to them, lean toward him being in Rome. When you think about the John Mark thing that we just talked about, that he was traveling often from Rome to Asia Minor, that seems to fit, though. It could fit. Who was the audience? Well, chapter 1 and verse 1, he's writing to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. You see here a map of the Roman provinces of that time, and there they all are. So he's writing to these groups of people. And it's interesting because Paul spent a lot of time writing to the brethren in Asia. Right? We have Ephesians, Colossians, and, and John, the seven letters, uh, the, yeah, the, the seven messages of Christ in chapters 1 through 3 of the Revelation. They were all there in Asia. Paul also wrote a letter, uh, the Galatians letter. So these people, this was a strong bed of Christianity, and Peter's writing to them as well. Why? Well, we're going to get to that. The main theme, the theme of 1 Peter is persecution. Remember, there's two aspects to persecution. There's the persecution that is absolute destruction and forbidding, which happened later in history, where you were no longer allowed to be a Christian. And if you were found to do so, you'd be arrested or killed. There's also that tribulation, that pressure that we face. And that is just a constant pressure by culture and those around us to try us to get to adapt to them instead of staying true to the teachings of our Lord. The church is facing both of those. Always has, always will. We're going to notice, I, I did a lot more slides in this, uh, for this lesson than normal because I want to look at a lot of sections in every single chapter how these themes are in there. So I put the scripture up here. I use the New King James so you can follow along if you want, um, but I'm going to have them all up here so we can read them together. So persecution, the main theme. Look at persecution in chapter 1. Chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. In this you greatly rejoice, our new life being begotten again in Christ Jesus. Though now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Chapter 2, 21 through 24. For to this, talking about persecution, you were called. Because Christ also suffered for us. We're called to be Christians, little Christs. We're, we're called to be Christ-like. And if he suffered, we were called to suffering so that you should follow his steps. He who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. In the next chapter, he's going to tell them to sanctify Christ in their heart in the face of persecution. What did Jesus do? Jesus committed himself to him, to God who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, so that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Chapter 3, 13 through 17. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? 
Sadly, the next sentence follows. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. He committed himself to God the Father. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Do you hear the situation of the recipients of this letter? They're undergoing persecution, but he says, it's okay, it strengthens you. You'll see, it'll see you through to the end, salvation of your soul. He says, you're suffering, but, but Christ did too, so keep your focus on him. And then you can hear the complaints, but we're suffering for doing good. We're trying to help people, and we're being persecuted. And he says, I know, it shouldn't be the case. Who's going to harm you if you do good? Unfortunately, there are people that harm people that do good. And if that happens, it is more blessed for you to suffer for that. Why? Because you're shining that light just like Jesus. Why did Jesus die? For doing ill or for doing good? For doing good. Chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same mind. Remember how he armed his mind? He committed himself to God the Father. What did he tell us to do? Sanctify Christ in your heart. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Because he had just said, if it's the will of God that we suffer for doing good, then let's do it. Verses 12 and 13 of chapter 4. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. As though some strange thing happened to you. I hear a little bit of Elijah there. Well, why does this happen to me? It didn't happen to other people. Don't think it's strange, brethren. This happens to the brethren all over. Instead of complaining about it or being shocked by it, there's, there's me, always shocked by it when the world acts like the world. When unchristian people act like unchristian people. I seem to always be shocked and surprised. Don't be surprised. Instead, rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. See, there it is, brethren. I don't enjoy suffering. Nobody enjoys suffering. But understanding that the joy that follows is the glory, that will see us through. That's what Peter is trying to, to write here. And finally, in chapter 5, 6 through 10, therefore, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Can you see in the context why Peter would say, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God? Because you know when people are pushing me, and they're calling me names, and they're attacking my family, I tend to want to rise up and swing hard instead of humbling myself under the mighty hand of God. I don't want to be persecuted. I want to fight back. That's my natural instinct. I think that's most of our natural instincts. But God says, if you suffer for my sake, you will be exalted. And so he says, don't avenge yourself. Humble yourself under God. You're not the master. You're not the Lord you serve. Serve God. Because he'll exalt you in due time. And he cares for you. Be sober. Be vigilant. Here's where all this persecution, brethren, is coming from. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. In the face of persecution, this is how we should understand and how we should react. Focus on what you know about God. Be about it, looking unto Jesus. And you can get through this because at the end of the day, chapter 1, salvation is yours. 
Chapter 2, being just like Christ. Chapter 3, you're going to be the emissary that can bring the whole world to Christ through your strong and valiant suffering. And chapter 4, again, just like Christ. And here in chapter 5, exaltation. Don't look at the, the short term. Remember the long term. The second main theme is relationships. This is a, a common pattern we see in the New Testament. If you think about Ephesians and Colossians, they're so similar. You talk about the relationship with God, and once you have that right, then the authors usually turn to all of our relationships in life. Even Jesus did it. What's the one commandment we should do? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he says, and the second one is love your neighbor. Okay? In Ephesians and Colossians, you've got to get right with God. Don't serve the flesh. You're the new man, not the old man. You need to be the new man living for Christ. What's the next thing he says? Husbands and wives, here's how do you interact. Children and parents, here's how you interact. Workers uh, and employers and employees, here's how you interact. You know, civil authority and um, citizens, here's how you interact. That relationship establishes all of our other relationships. So it's very common. Chapter 1, verses, verse 3. Talk about relationships, brethren. Watch the building relationships. By the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. So, the God and Father of our Lord has begotten us again. What does that make him of us? He is again our Father, just like our Lord. Verse 14, we are to be as obedient children. See the relationship? He's our Father, our loving parent. We are obedient children, not conforming ourselves to the former lusts as in our ignorance. Verse 17, if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges each according to his, each one's work, conduct yourselves through the time of your stay here in fear. Why? Why do I live this way? Because of your Father and what you know about your Father and how that He will judge you who are being suffering, or who are suffering, excuse me. Remember 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians? You who are suffering, what are we going to receive? Those who are persecuting us, what are they going to receive? Trouble. Don't forget that. The relationship starts, though, with our Father, trusting Him. Verse 23, having been born again. See how Peter is just in the first chapter, keeps helping us to understand we're not the people we once were. We've been born again. God is our Father. There's a relationship now between the Almighty Creator of the universe and us. And that changes things. How does it change? Look at chapter 2, verse 2. We are to be like newborn babes, desiring the pure milk of the word that we may grow to be more like Christ. We'll grow in that relationship where we won't be babes in Christ hopefully one day. We can be servants. Verse 9, because look how we grow from being babies in Christ to being the chosen generation, the royal priesthood, the holy nation, his own special people, and we're to be about a purpose, proclaiming the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 18, notice now he's talking about interrelationships, servants, employees, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. Verse 25, Christians, you used to be like sheep going astray, but you've now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. See the relationship? Chapter 3, verse 1. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Why? Why should I honor my wife in that way? Because if I don't, my prayers will be hindered. If my relationship with my wife is not what God wants it to be, wants it to be, my relationship with God is not what I want it to be. Interesting thing here, a little side note, that word in verse 7, husbands giving honor to the wife. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 19, 
we were not saved, redeemed by corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. That's the same word, precious there. Here in verse 7, you could say, husbands, giving honor to your wife. Husbands, making your wives precious in your sight and in your life. Relationships. Chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you. Again, you can tell Peter was a preacher like me because he says finally. But you know there's two more chapters. Right? Finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. That's the church. All of you. Not just husbands and wives. All of you love one another. Support one another. Verse 15, the relationship again. It's hard though. It's not easy. It doesn't come naturally, Lord. But if we sanctify the Lord God in our hearts, not only will we be able to do that relationship he demands, but then we're going to be reaching out to the persecutors. And they're going to hopefully see and hopefully ask. And we'll have an opportunity to bring them into this relationship with God. Chapter 4. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies. That in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Help one another, love one another, and the relationship between you and God, the gifts and talents you've received, use for one another and help one another. Can you minister? Minister. Can you teach? Teach. Can you lead singing? Lead singing. Can you teach little ones? Teach little ones. Can you write cards? Write cards. Can you sit with the sick and not have to say a word? What a powerful ministry that is. Whatever we can do, whatever God has given us, use it to glorify God through Jesus Christ. Verse 19 of chapter 4. Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as to faithful Creator. Notice it brings up the suffering again. Tells them to commit their souls to God again. And then he reminds them, your father, the faithful creator. Chapter 5, verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Talks about the leadership in the church. Serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. The call to serve the church as shepherds for the chief shepherd. Verses 5 and 6, he goes on and says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. He's not talking about church elders there. He's talking about your older. Those who are older to you. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. Be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And then that verse again about humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Why? Because he loves us. He's our father. And we have this relationship with one another. So we love one another and care for one another. That submit, it means seeking the other's good, even if it costs us. Finally, with relationships, chapter 5, 9, resist the devil, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Not only do we have a relationship with God, not only do we have the relationship within our families, not only do we have the relationship within our church family, but there's the church worldwide, that we are a part of. It's a special thing. I pray that if you travel, that you make it a point to visit with churches because there is nothing more special than to go on the other side of the world, assemble with brethren, and five minutes into the service, you realize you're home and with brethren. There's, there's just no way to describe it. I guess I just tried. But, but. And again, Concluding with relationships at this lender, end of this letter, greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. We're supposed to love one another. 
relationships. In the face of persecution, those relationships should strengthen. The relationship with God and the relationship with one another. Last major theme of 1 Peter is the appointing of value. I'll get through these a little more quickly, just uh, touching the highlights. Chapter 1, he talks about the precious blood of Christ that we were sanctified with, not with silver and gold. What does that mean? That means we should value his blood shed for us more than the silver and gold the world offers us. Chapter 2, 5 and 9, we are the living stones, brethren. We are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. You need to value who you are in God's plan. Well, I, I go to that church building and I sit there. No, you are a living stone that the church is built up. That's valuable. That's why we harp on attendance. It's because we need you. And the building without lots of the bricks is not a building, okay? We have value. And if we value the value that God has installed in us, we shine ever so much more brightly. Brethren, do you understand? You're not just a Christian. You're not just a member of the church that is Christ. You're the royal priesthood, part of the holy nation of God. You need to value that. And it'll help you figure out your priorities with the world. Chapter 3, talking to women about the incorruptible beauty of a quiet spirit. To God, that is more precious than outside adornment. Okay? We need to have that same value. That's where it needs to be apportioned. Chapter 4, we should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Why? Because we value heaven. Because we value Jesus' sacrifice. Because we value the honor and glory that he's bestowed upon us and that he holds in store for us. In chapter 5, leaders always looking to the chief shepherd, humbling ourselves because we know he's going to exalt us. And I value that exaltation. I value being able to see my Lord face to face. Application. Well, what's in it for us? Well, Peter was writing to Christians in the world. We are Christians in the world. So every point that he makes is applicable to us. Persecution, it's not necessarily hot here in the United States, but that pressure, the filth that we're surrounded by, it's a constant attempt to get us to forsake the sanctification that God calls us to. What are we going to value? Getting along to go along or going along to getting along, excuse me? Or are we going to value standing on the principles of God? Are we going to be okay to deprive ourselves of what it doesn't seem right to have to deprive ourselves? Well, why can't I go see a movie? Well, if it's filled with filth and garbage, why would you submit yourself to it? Why would you support it with your money? We can make those choices or we can stand with God we too also have to be constantly mindful of the relationships that God calls us to. Who's to be first and foremost? God. How are husband and wife supposed to get along? It's been spelled out. Families. How are parents and children supposed to interact? It's been spelled out. Are you pursuing it? Is that the standard that you understand that you're to live by? And then, how do we interact with one another in the church? Are we just people that show up to sing together once in a while? Or are we the family of God? It's our choice. And it's all about the last point. What do we value? What do you value? The world or God? Now, when I say I value God more than the world, it doesn't mean I don't appreciate a good sunset or a sunrise. It doesn't mean I don't appreciate uh, peanut butter pie, right? Painfully obvious, that. But... What it means is God always comes first in all things. And I understand, and we understand, that the purpose of this world is so that we could have the space to choose. So we're not going to use that wonderful gift to choose poorly. Instead, we're going to use this wonderful gift 
to work His will because we value the relationship He wants with us. How much? Look at the cross. So much in this letter. Brethren, called to God through the blood of His Son, those of you who are Christians partook of that great grace and came washed yourselves to your sins, dedicated yourselves to putting God first and foremost in all aspects of your life, to die and to rise again to live for Him. Easier said, easier begun than done. It's difficult. The world is constantly trying to get our attention, trying to shift our values, trying to change our relationships. If you haven't been doing what God has told us to be doing, Turn back. He still stands. He is unchanging. If you're not a Christian, God calls you to him. He loves you so much that he sent his son into the world to live and die for you because he just wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to be with you forever. If you've never taken up on his offer, why not this evening? If there's anything we can do to help any of you, we'd ask that you come forward as together we stand and sing.